Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How are we feeling today? What? Now, come on, how are we feeling? Sorry, I'm not going to do one of those American rave up things, but I'm a POM, you know, we don't do these sort of things around there. But uh, seriously, how are we today? Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for finding the time to join me this morning. Um, my presentation, as it says, is the ch challenges running a WordPress business when you're not a developer. And that actually makes me feel a little bit insecure in a room like this because I'm surrounded by WordPress amazing people. Um, so just bear with me, please, and just, just try and help me on side. Um, and some of you might think, you know, this is a good opportunity to have a chuckle as a newbie in a, in a WordPress world. But I would actually challenge you, really, just to think for a moment, because I would like to really touch about the challenges of doing anything when you're not an expert in that particular field. Um, so I guess that's a bit of a, a subtext behind what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, can I ask, I'm not going to ask anybody to say in what, but how many people think they're an expert in something? Thank you, yeah. I dare say many of us like to think we're an expert in something. And a few years ago, I was an expert in something. And the trouble with being an expert in something I found is that you get a little bit complacent. You think you're bulletproof. You think you're doing really well because people keep on paying you to be an expert. And of course, in order to be a really good expert, you need to narrow down and narrow down and narrow down. And then you get paid more and more and more for being a specialist in that field. Until one day I woke up and discovered the field I was an expert in didn't really exist anymore. Unfortunately, it probably took me a year or two to actually spot that. I was probably in denial for a little period of time. So, I don't want to make this presentation a presentation about challenges, despite the, <laughs> despite the label. I'd actually like to flip the coin on that and talk about what to do about it, the solutions to that. And I've only got 10, so uh, I'm just going to count down from 10. And the first one is this, is to adopt a growth mindset. How many of you here have heard about the concept of growth mindset? A few people, that's good. Well, let me just briefly touch on it. Um, Carol Dweck, who's a, now a professor at the University of Stanford in the US, uh, basically pioneered this field of, I think it's called psychology. Um, one of her original experiments is she went to an inner, inner city school in, I think it was Chicago, and she randomly chose a, w a year group and split the class into two. One class she put in one room, and the other class she put in the other. And in one room, everything in the teaching was about success. It was about ability and success. Everybody was praised for what they achieved. And in the other room, all the motivation was not around success, it was about effort, it was about learning, it was about trying. Which room do you think was the one that over the year actually became more successful? Any views? It was the learning side. I could spend a whole presentation or three on this particular one, but the growth mindset is all about believing that you can actually learn or do anything if you're determined enough, whereas the fixed mindset is all about saying, I'm either good at it or I aren't, or I'm, or I'm not. So I guess for me, as, a, as, a, as an expert in my previous field, I've had to do a bit of a shift from being a, a fixed mindset to, a, uh, to, a, to a, uh, a growth mindset. Okay, so I'd once developed a website, I think it was in the 1990s sometime, uh, and then for the next 20 years I totally ignored anything digital. So when I found with more time on my hands than I was expecting, I found this thing called WordPress and started playing with it a bit and got rather excited about it because it does all sorts of exciting things. It's a bit like a, a grown person's Lego in my view. You know, you can do all sorts of exciting things. And I went out trying to sell WordPress to people. And then one day somebody very kindly said to me, you have a solution looking for a problem which I actually appreciated somebody telling me because I was so enthusiastic about this enabling technology I forgot about the fact it has to be applied to something. And little aside, I'm now doing a bit of work with blockchain and I'm seeing the similar sort of trends there. It's another technology that's, that's looking for problems. Well, I think there's plenty of problems out there just as there are for WordPress. So I guess uh, for number nine for me is around nailing a problem. And for me, the problem that I came across was you know, classic dad with kids sat by the swimming pool one day at the swimming lessons and I was receiving lots of, I think there was some event coming up, so people were giving me pieces of paper with their name on it and a cheque 
or maybe a pile of banknotes, which I then had to collate and yada yada yada. And I discovered, well, with WordPress, you can just put a put a form builder on there. I chose Gravity Forms, which I'm sure many of you have come across. Uh, put entries in with a payment gateway, and all of a sudden, everybody could off enter online, and it became a lot easier. The challenge I discovered with Gravity Forms, which is a great form builder, is it doesn't actually tell you very easily who's done what. So I, um, I got a guy in Romania to build me a little plugin that just provided a simple dashboard functionality. You know, a little pie chart that says this many people have come from there, and this many people have come from there, and this many people have come from there, and a, cal a counter that says you've got so many bookings. And I quite liked it, so I started using it for me. And then one idle weekend, I spun up a website and put easy digital downloads on it, a payment gateway from PayPal, and offered it for sale. That made me very nervous, because by offering something for sale, you sort of assume it needs to work. And what happens if it doesn't work? You've got to fix it. And what, what happens if people don't like it? They want their money back. So I decided that I would, number eight, kill my view of perfectionism, and I would price it for the price of a good cup of coffee, $4.50. And I said, no guarantees, no refunds, no support. And I just left it. And then about three weeks later, you know you get these funny messages from PayPal every so often, you just delete them, delete them, delete them. One day I actually didn't delete one, and I read it, and it wasn't hey, I'm your business manager coming to tell you about so-and-so. It was actually, somebody's just paid you some money. I thought, okay. And then a few days later, somebody else paid me some money. And gradually over time, about every other day, somebody would pay me $4.50 for this thing. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. Maybe there's something in it. And so started the, uh, the experiment that I'm on now. And uh, I'll just show you this slide. I'm sorry it's a bit busy. Uh, but this has really been the, uh, the GF chart journey since then. I think that was 2014. This, is, this graph's taken straight out of Easy Digital Downloads. The bottom line is the, um, is the revenue. The top line is the number of, number of sales. And what I've done here is to illustrate the different things I've done at different times. Now I'll just walk through some of the, the, the key things here. Up to here I was charging $4.50, which is obviously next to nothing and it's just a bit of a paid for the odd coffee or two, and it was a bit of a conversation piece, but it, it was basically meaningless. I thought, well, $4.50 is not really a reasonable price. Uh, if a coder wanted to do what this does, there'd be several hours of time, and for those coders that charge several hundred dollars an hour, it's worth several hundred dollars to the right sort of uh, people. So overnight, I moved the price from $4.50 to $45. I was expecting the demand to crash, which it did for a, few, a week or two, and then all of a sudden it started to build up again. At the same time I introduced service, which was basically me just trying to cope with anybody that contacted me. Um, and to cut a long story short, the demand uh, has continued to grow, but obviously with much better revenue because we got $45. Then we introduced a $99 price point. Then we introduced a $149 price point. We even introduced a, a $4.99 price point um, a couple of months back. And it's a bit busy, this graph, but what's basically happened is the revenue started to move away from, from the unit sales, uh, which for what I think is probably an, a, a, a niche service, to me, is, is exactly what we wanted to achieve. So we got to, and all the way through this, at this stage, when I was getting decent revenue coming in, I hired a professional developer. Um, and I decided to go pay full price for a really good quality Gravity Forms developer, uh, a lady called Naomi C. Bush, who's in America, charges in US dollars, who really understands Gravity Forms backwards. And I've employed her ever since part-time to build out features. And those features basically come from a Trello board where people put in requests, and we basically look at what the most popular things are, and we build the roadmap on that. When we got to this stage, we thought we'd invest in some SEO, because SEO is what you're supposed to do to get some more traffic. And I think you can probably see from the numbers here that to start off with, we were sort of trending up, upwards. But after a while, we, we started to trend downwards again. Now obviously this is sales, this is not traffic, and SEO drives traffic, and it depends on search terms and, and all the other things. But fundamentally, it was actually costing us more, because I hired somebody to do this, 
to invest in SEO than we were actually bringing in. It didn't seem to be heading the right way, so we decided to stop that and focus instead on looking after our existing customers. So this is where we outsource service. We now outsource service to an organization called WP SAS, WordPress Service as a Service, and they've been an absolute godsend. They deal with all our level one and level two support now, um, which means that I, as, a, uh, as the uh, overall person responsible, don't need to get too involved with that, except when there's a really hairy issue. And then we introduced renewals earlier this year that had to be set up 12 months before because uh, people had to sign up to renew after 12 months there. So that was a long time in the coming. And you can see now, you know, our earnings are really going quite strongly, but our sales are, are not very good. So I'm in a dilemma currently in that I'm making okay money from this, but it's not long-term sustainable because my sales are heading, heading the wrong way. You know, I'm being very honest with you. you know, this, is, this is the reality of this sort of thing. And this is a side activity for me, so I'm kind of not too worried. So I do need to, uh, I do need to um, put some more effort in. But look, I've spent a bit of time there because I just wanted to show you sort of experimentation and what it does and what it doesn't do. Now, in order to experiment properly, you need to clearly understand your customers. And I found that quite tricky because most are in the US and we don't like talking. You can email and you may get an email back. So what I've tried doing is to get up very early in the morning and then get the URL of some of my customers and do a Google search and then phone them up. <laughs> People are blown away when somebody phones on the other side of the world and wants to chat to them about a particular plugin. So I've got a bit of information that way. I've got some information from people that put in requests. The support desk is quite a dangerous place to get information from because you only see the exceptions there, you only see the problems. So I can't say I've got the magic solution, but certainly I'm, I'm trying to understand um, customers. The other thing I've discovered, I mean all of this I think is, is obvious, but somehow you need to do it to realize it, that um, the action beats planning. Planning is very important, but at the end of the day, planning is only telling a story to yourself about what the future will be or could be. And it's not until you actually try to do these things that you discover whether you told yourself a truthful story or a, uh, a fictitious story. Um, hence that slide on, on experimentation, really, just to, uh, just to show what, what happens. Another point for me has been what I call unleashing energizers. For me personally, you know, when you've got a whole bunch of stuff happening, this it doesn't take much time. There's other, a lot of other stuff happening in my life. It's easy not to do something, so I'm trying to tune into those things that energize me versus those things that don't. And one thing I did discover is that support is not very energizing, and certainly since I've outsourced support, that's really helped me because uh, I'm not dragged down by that, you know, you're cooking dinner for the family, thinking, oh, after dinner I've got to go and log on and deal with so and so and such and such. Um, so that's, that's worked really well, for example. The other thing, um, is what I call used quality ingredients. You know, there's a big temptation I find in internet land to outsource to cheap markets or to buy cheap product here or to get cheap hosting there. It might be right, but for me, I've discovered not. Uh, we try to use quality components because quality components mean that you trust them generally and it reduces support and it just gives you an easier life. I mean, for example, we use WP Engine, which is a high-quality host. We use e easy digital downloads with their suite of services like Stripe and, and, um, and PayPal. We use Help Desk. Um, you know, I pay a developer in the US, which is not a cheap market, to, um, to develop. We have very, very few bugs, touch wood, um, which really helps. Um, we use WP SaaS, which is also in the US. Uh, but you know that seems to be really helping on our support side, and we're getting good reviews from there. So I found that using quality ingredients is a uh, is a very good thing, at least for us to do. And you've seen what our our revenue numbers look like. I mean, yeah, we could put a lot of effort and reduce the costs, but I think the upside opportunity from increasing revenue is far more significant than uh, than reducing cost. I guess the other point for me is to uh, make myself redundant, and I don't want to sit on a beach. But it's not about giving myself a job. It's about allowing the, pro the, the project, the plug-in, to grow in a commercially sustainable way with sort of minimal intervention from me. 
So I'm trying to adopt a bit of a product manager type mentality. Uh, I think Stephanie had a talk yesterday which I couldn't, um, I couldn't attend unfortunately, but I'm sure her message was about outsource wherever possible or get, get other people involved to, uh, to do things. Um, and the, the final point, uh, and it's what I really need to tell myself every day, is ultimately it's all about selling. Unless you can sell stuff, it's fantastic having a, a brilliant idea or even a brilliant product that people love, but unless you can actually get out there and, and sell it enough, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to go very far. So we're four years old. Uh, as you can see, we've had a bit of a, bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, just to let you know what we're about, uh, the plugin is GF Chart, uh, which, as this diagram shows, if you enter information via gravity forms, if you sell via gravity forms, if you have a booking thing, or if you're doing a survey, or things like that, you can produce charts very quickly. Uh, you can get tables, or at least you can put the numbers into the tables. You want to know how many bookings you've got, you want to know how many people from China are coming, how many people have ordered gluten free food, all that sort of thing. Um, can be done very quickly. We seem to have a lot of uh, higher education institutions, a lot of churches, holiday resorts. We seem to be quite popular with those. During the US election, I'm not going to talk politics, but we seem to have quite a few pollsters use this. Um, and all this information is up to date. It allows you to put it straight on the front page or a, a front facing page on your website. You don't have to log in to get the information. So it allows you to, uh, allows you to interact. If anybody's interested, uh, we've got a special offer this weekend, this weekend only. Use the, uh, use the tag for this, uh, this weekend without the hashtag WCSID and you can get our top tier $149 version for only $49 just this weekend. I have to say that building on top of Gravity Forms was made me really nervous initially because I was sort of beholden to somebody else. It's actually proven to be a really good thing to do. Uh, there's a suite of really good other Gravity Forms premium add-ons around, like Gravity PDF um, from, uh, from Port Macquarie. They do a fantastic um, ability to create Gravity Forms data into PDFs for all sorts of professional looking documents and we use them on one of our other projects. There's also Gravity View which allows you to convert your Gravity Forms data into almost like a database, searchable database, slice and dice, print things out in all sorts of different formats. Um, there's also Gravity Flow, which allows you to drive professional workflow type, you know, holiday approvals for things, holiday uh, re vacation requests, there's all sorts of things. So around Gravity Forms, there's, there's actually quite a suite of, uh, of different extension plugins, so it's actually proven to be um, a very good community to be part of. Um, so we think we're, we've heard about big data, we like to think we're kings of small data. If you've got a website with a little bit of data coming in, you want to see the big picture. You know, even if you've got a contact form and you want to see what the trends are, this can do a little chart for you trending over time. So um, I don't know whether I finished too early or too late, uh, but with that I'd like to close and see if anybody has any questions. We'll run, we'll run around with the mic, so wave your hand if you've got a question for Ben. Anyone? Hey Ben, any chance we could see a live demo of your uh, of your plugin? Oh, if we've got time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have, have we time. Got internet access here. This is one in my glasses. Show me age. Would anybody mind if I show the video for this? I, I, I didn't want this to be a sales thing. I wanted to talk to you about plugins, but this is a one minute, 16 second video. It sort of gives an idea, and then I'll show you a few other bits. Is that, is that OK? Yeah, go for okay. it. OK. Is there audio on this? This is Mary. She runs the company website, which is helping the business to thrive. So well, in fact, that the Middle East always been asked to pay new functions. Sales want the lead generation form, marketing want the customer satisfaction survey, and George, the CEO, wants to impress his mates with an online booking form for the annual golf day. 
faithfully in area research strategy forms to do this quickly and easier. Job done. Except that it isn't. Lots of forms and lots of customers means lots of information. And although it's said to be perfect, it gets lost in a pile of emails and spreadsheets. The important thing is getting this. Customers get annoyed and George goes to pews. Then we discuss GF chart. GF chart displays a visual overview of what's going on. Get updated automatically. Managers can now see the big picture and focus in on areas that require their attention. Customers are delighted, staff are relieved, and George puts a negative bonus. Thank you to Media, Media One for that. I think they did a great job. So that, that's the sort of marketing-y bit. This is some of the things that it produces. Um, so you can see if you, if you move the, the mouse over, it, it will come up with, with information. There's a few use cases. Um, there's various things there. And this is a very sort of very, very rough view about how it works internally. It's, uh, it's only very, very brief here, where you just... It, it's, it's, there is a tiny short code, but it's, it's a low-code, zero-code solution, so you can very quickly just select from drop-down menus the different fields that you want to slice and dice and very quickly uh, produce a chart. So once it's installed, typically you can produce a chart within, say, uh, 60 to 90 seconds. And there's a working demo here with a, a sample form, I don't know, what's my name, Ben, uh, where am I going from, Iowa, which tour am I going to, let's go for Bolivian poetry somewhere, and let's say I don't, I'm going to have coffee, and I'm going to bring my pet with me, uh, do I believe it's important to brush my teeth after every meal, views please, yes, yes. yes. all right, strongly agree or just agree, strongly, strongly agree, so that's going to cost me five bucks. I mean, obviously, it's a stupid form, this, but it's just to give you a bit of an idea. Um, this is a live demo, so we hope that it works. Um, and so here, this, this has now produced the sort of total sales. You can see, according to the type of tour, or over all time, or just units, units this month. So that's units. This is dollars. But uh, what else have we got? This is over. This is by time, showing for each month. And there's some other ones here, with various other sort of uh, parameters. So if you need a progress bar, this is good for non-for-profits who've got campaigns coming up, either for money raising campaigns or they want to get a certain number of people. And then there's some drink choices and operations reports. Sorry, that was a long answer to a quick question, but as <laughs> Ben, I have a question, if you don't mind one. <laughs> um, I noticed w w when you were telling your story, you said that you just popped it straight up and started selling it as a premium plugin. Have you ever, so is that, that continues to be a sales model? Like a lot of, in the plugin business, in the WordPress ecosystem, like typically you'd have the free, the freemium model where you have the free version in the .org repository, then you have the upgrade to pro and that's proven very successful in a lot of cases and then you have subscription models. Have you always just had the pro only version? That's a really good question. We have always had the, the pro version, only the pro version. About once a year we have the should we go on the WordPress repository type discussion and every year so far we've decided against it. I have to say that in my mode of experimentation I'm tempted to have a go. The thing that does put me off it is the feedback I'm getting is once you're on there, you can't ever come off. So you know there's a lot of plugins on there that have, haven't been updated for several years, and you think, well, who the hell are these guys? Uh, I understand once we've made that step, we can't ever step back without the risk of our brand looking a bit tarnished. But perhaps others in the, view, in the room may have, have views about that. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm wondering how you avoid people forking your software. Is it open source and can people fork it? It is open source. Yes, people can fork it. In fact, every so often we have a competitor that starts up. Um, but it's not... It worried me to start off with, but it doesn't seem to worry me now. 
I realise we've actually, it's actually, we've discovered it's not actually that easy to do what this does. Trying to get the JavaScript charts to marry up with what's a quite a complicated data structure and gravity forms actually requires a lot of effort. And we seem to have worked out how to do that. So it's not actually that easy to copy. Because gravity forms keeps on moving forward, WordPress keeps on moving forward, we do need to keep up to date. Um, and the other thing I think, and this is my hypothesis, is that most developers actually want a professional solution for their clients they can rely on going forward. They don't want something that works today and doesn't work tomorrow. So um, it's a really good question. Um, perhaps by putting, turning up here saying, I'm not worried, people will then think, well, that's a good challenge. But uh, so far, it's, uh, it's been all right for us. Feels like first to market counts for a lot in the plugin world as I well. I guess so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Vincent. More questions? Hi, I, I have a, a comment and a question. So a comment on that first question. Uh, I, I, I think an interesting model with, with premium plugins is because you can obviously fork it and it's open source and anybody can do it, what you often sell is not so much the plugin but the support for the plugin. And I think since you say you now have support, that's probably what people are paying for, not the code base that anybody can use anyway. So yeah, just a thought, interested in your thoughts. The, the other thing is, it's more about a technical side of it, so sorry if, if this is not your side of it, but I, I love charts and I, I like what you're doing here, so I was just wondering, I assume you're not doing the JavaScript charts from scratch, you're probably using some kind of library, so yeah. what, what are you using and why are you using that other than a different library? Um, it's something I'm interested in, so I just yeah. wanted to... It, just, it's a really good question, just as we were a bit nervous when we went for Gravity Forms as the platform to build on. We had to make a similar decision when we went for a, a chart library. And chart libraries are coming and going all the time. So we, for better or for worse, made a decision a few years ago to go with the Google Charts library. Frankly, I think it's a bit daggy. Uh, it's a bit scientific and the colors are a bit, I mean, you can change the colors, but they're a bit, so there's a, there is a segment of our customer base that wants a lot more pastel shades with, with gentle flowing curves. A lot of them seem to be from Italy, and I, I, guess, I guess that doesn't surprise me, but what have you. But in terms of your, your question, we made the decision for that. In the background, we haven't said we're going to do that forever. We've tried to build it in a way so that if, a different, if we do want to bring in a different chart library in future, or even swap out chart libraries or give people the options, that can be done. It's actually easier said than done because they all have their own undocumented features uh, and, and challenges and personalities. And it's a live issue for us because at the moment, uh, due to the way that JavaScript works, you can't easily insert these things into PDFs or into emails. So we're looking at using an external rendering service to allow this to be inserted into um, PDFs and emails. Uh, and that will necessitate probably some slight change of, of chart library. Here. Hi. How's your affiliate program going? Is that important to your business model? So another good question. Um, it's going well, but I can't rely on it. Um, there's, we've got one particularly good affiliate in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, who's a real enthusiast on the plug-in, and I think that's probably why we seem to have got a disproportionate number of Dutch customers. But it's, I don't know what the percentage is, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a quite a distinct minority of sales, so it's not something we can rely on. There's a lot of people that sign up for affiliates who never ever sell you anything. Uh, this, this one, one or two, got a reasonable volume from. It's worth doing, I think, but I wouldn't focus on it. Any others? Uh, just, a quick, just a quick question. I just wanted to, um, have you hiding? <laughs> hiding from Corey down the front down there. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask, what have been your most successful sales kind of techniques and that? What do you, you find that's most, and also too, how you're saying now that your kind of sales are slumping, what's your kind of next step to address that? So yeah. those yeah. two questions in one. Great. Another great question. Most successful sales thing? I think it's been the completely surprising ones which won't be any help to you. It's like a very, very, very large American company contacted us earlier this year and said, 
we want to use your plugin across all of our WordPress sites. But we don't want to have to pay you, all of our people going for $49. Please will you give us a really expensive package to cover all of our licenses. So that's when we launched the, I think it was the $399 or $499 thing, which I didn't really want to do, but I did it anyway for then. And then we made two sales that month. And it's like, wow, but we haven't made one since. So um, I guess that was a listening to a customer need and, and, and acting on it. What I have discovered is whenever you work on it, at some stage in future it will grow, but you won't ever be able to link up what it was that led, led to what, which is why I put that, that chart up earlier to show that it's, clear that it's clear that actions do lead to results, but one to one. The biggest driver of revenue is to increase price. It's not that we seem to get a different customer base every, every time we increase price. So I mean, one thing we could do going forward is to become a, a very premium type thing and only focus on the, on the top tier of customers. But to answer your question about what next, um, we're planning on writing a recipe book. So saying, if you want to do this, and this is how you want to do it, that will go, both go on the site, but also will become sort of tweetable social media material, uh, so that we'll have a lot more content to put out into different channels. Hi, I was just curious about what effects of GDPR and international laws and taxes and is that a lot of grief or is that something you just come to terms as you have to? Another good question. You know I talked about energizers and de-energizers. That's a big de-energizer. Yeah, I'm devoting time onto that and it's like oh. <laughs> Any further questions? Yeah, Ben, uh, you mentioned you, you pretty much outsource most of the company um, in terms of the plugin development and the support. Um, how does that affect your, your overall uh, profit margins? That's some fantastic questions today. I, um, I, my mentality around the company is almost like a big revenue share. One of the reasons I charge in US dollars rather than Ameri uh, Aussie dollars, even though I'm an Australian-based organisation, is most of my costs are in US dollars. So I think about what the top line is and almost like a value chain, what, what, what you take off down that. So I guess I'm not... I probably don't think of it in the way a traditional business person would, would with a factory that has lots of fixed costs. I mean, although my costs are sort of semi-fixed, they're, they're fixed month to month, they're not fixed long term. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question very well, Jake, but uh, that's, just, that's just the way I view it. I mean, my consulting business I view very different. I have another WordPress business that's in uh, training for a, a very narrow niche. But each has a very different business model behind it. I guess that's part of the experimentation I'm doing here. I, I think we developers do tend to forget sometimes that our time is worth something. So, you know, when you're paying someone else to do your development, you're very aware of the value of that service and of those costs. When you're working on your own plugin, you're often doing it in your free time and you don't really consider it a cost per se. So it might look like your profit margin is higher, but maybe it's not. And at been great presentation. You can't possibly do all those things, and so I, I find myself, and I, and I might be working on the back end of the website or something, where, where really what I want to be doing is the, the content. And uh, there are times when I'm thinking, well, I, I've got two keyboards here. Can I possibly uh, be typing in with my left hand uh, the content and coding with the right hand at the same time? It's not possible. <laughs> so sometimes you've got to take that hit in order to be able to really focus on that that area of business, uh, especially if you've got a couple of other businesses going. Yeah. We, with this conversation is about the opportunity cost of your time and leverage, you know, put a little bit of effort in to get a big effort somewhere else. Yeah, I think the question is that how much percentage would you allocate to the development uh, funding and also for the support, like, you know, is it 10%, 20% and the overall sales? What's the percentage that you actually get from it? Yeah, I overinvest in development at the moment. Yeah, because that's really important. Without, without the product, what do you sell really? Well, Yes, and 
one thing I could do would be to turn off development, or at least turn it down very significantly, mm -hmm. uh, and move the funding entirely towards marketing. Uh, and then, as presumably as sales grow, potentially put, put money back into development again. Because de development has a maintenance approach, like Gravity Forms 3.3 came out, so we had to do that. We've got a um, Gutenberg block coming up, so we're, we've got one of those in beta. You know, there's all this background stuff you need to do just to stay standing still. And then you've got the adding new features. We're doing both at the moment. We could just decide to sit in maintenance mode. So far, we haven't done that. Well, did you have one, Ricky? Oh, no, that, that's probably yeah, I think, I think we're probably out of time. So thank you so much to Ben for sharing uh, so many details about the plug-in business with us. And Ben's available throughout the rest of the day. Yeah? Uh, I've got another conference I've got to go to. He's not available for the rest of the day. So if you have more questions, rush down the front and mob him. No. <laughs> but can I say thank you so much for your engagement and great questions. It's, it's superb. So thank you. And if anybody's got any suggestions to me offline, I'd love to hear them. So thanks so much, Ben.